So I, I have to admit it's probably one of my favourite frogs. I don't think I'm the only one. Um, um, so I should start by saying um, or paying respects to the traditional custodians on the land in which this observation was made of being the Wurundjeri people. Uh, so the area that we're talking about is Coldstream. So for those of you who know it, in, although I say the middle Yarra catchment uh, kind of on the, arguably on the edge of the, the upper Yarra catchment, um, Gruyere, uh, Yarra Glen, uh, that sort of area. Uh, is what we're talking about. I should also begin by admitting that the uh, main credit for this observation goes to the last two co-contributors on the, uh, the project, Grant Harris and James Gibson, who are doing a vegetation assessment on the property uh, where the frogs were found. Uh, so the, again, the area that we're talking about um, kind of the middle, but again, so cold stream, a uh, little way uh, just south of the Yarra. Um, in the Shire of the Yarra Ranges. And historically, in terms of the wider Yarra catchment, uh, some of the last records of growling grass frog were in this area. Uh, but still going back to oh, the start of the century, year 2000, um, interestingly enough though, Nick Kleeman, our Vice President, who I don't think is here tonight, uh, received a photo from a landowner in 2006 of a growling grass frog in Gruyere, so just uh, uh, to the east of Coldstream, uh, but in the same sub-catchment, the Stringybark Creek, as the property where this population of growling grass frogs were found um, only a couple of years ago, two thousand, uh, end of 2019. Um, this is a general area we're talking about, purposely trying to avoid being any more specific uh, for privacy and uh, threatened species security concerns because they are listed federally as a, a vulnerable species as well as at the state level. Um, and this is what we saw when we turned up to confirm um, that they were there. Uh, so on the uh, first night of survey, seven frogs, and they're all in the water, well out of reach, as you, as, you know, it's kind of typical. Uh, we heard 12, though, and they were also calling uh, from the, the middle of the uh, dam, as they also tend to do. Um, and the second time we went, I uh, found 14, um, but even so, uh, we know from other, other people's observations and surveys, um, that's a vast underestimate, it's not really a, um, an accurate proxy for how many frogs are actually going to be there, so the numbers, the actual numbers of how many ground grass frogs are in a given site like this, uh, the few occasions we do know where they've found absolutely every frog. Funnily enough, they tend to be development situations where they're removing the habitat. Uh, the, the numbers are absolutely astronomical in the hundreds. Um, you know, when all you're seeing is something like 14 frogs uh, just going out looking for them. Uh, but about 20 uh, heard calling from within the, the dam on the our second night of survey, a couple of nights later, um, the day before uh, New Year's Eve. Um, so as frog nutters tend to do, we you know, <laughs> look for them at all, you know, the most inconvenient times sometimes. <laughs> but uh, convenient night for the frogs anyway, because um, for whatever reason, a lot of them were up on the bank. So they, uh, yeah, it's a little bit easier to catch why would we necessarily want to catch them? Um, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, in this case. Very quickly, uh, so what makes suitable habitat for a growling grass frog? In terms of its breeding habitat, uh, so we're talking about aquatic habitat. Given that, 
this is a very simple diagram, but effective, from Jeff Hurd, uh, who's the growing grass for the guru. Uh, and all it shows is that habitat suitability improves with an increasing cover of aquatic vegetation, but particularly submerged, and to some extent, floating vegetation, to a lesser extent, emergent vegetation. So plants that are rooted in the water but, but emerging above the surface. Uh, and in some cases that can prove to be a problem. I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So how does this site stack up, given that? In terms of the aquatic habitat, really good. Uh, so a, a relatively high cover is submerged and, uh, and floating plants as opposed to uh, the lower cover of emergent veg. And in terms of terrestrial habitat, so non-breeding, but what they're using to forage and disperse uh, and overwinter. Um, interestingly, Jeff found that bare ground and rock are two of the most important microhabitats. The frogs are using more than some of the others that you might think they'd use in preference, like you know, ground vegetation and, and emergent vegetation, but growing up on the banks. So in that respect, we're talking about species that would usually be considered as emergent if they were rooted in the water, but they also occasionally grow up on the banks. Um, and we now well, kind of recognise that there could be reasons as to why the frogs might necessarily choose bare ground or rocks you know, where they're exposed to predators, uh, you would think, um, among other things. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the site didn't stack up quite as well. So a higher cover of shrubs and trees, but still not so much that it stopped most of the sun from getting through to the, to the dam. Uh, so most of the water surface was still exposed to the sun for at least part of the day, uh, which is important. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, I'll mention why, uh, but, but also leaving areas of the banks a bit more exposed, or if anything with uh, shorter or lower growing uh, vegetation, grasses and that sort of thing. Uh, so a bit more of a complicated diagram from Jeff, uh, but basically, uh, just indicating that these, these things are influences on water temperature. So how much sun obviously is getting into the, to the aquatic habitat uh, and influencing that, how much overshading vegetation there is. And so what you find is that in uh, these breeding habitats where you have a higher cover of a emer taller emergent vegetation and a higher shrub and tree cover, uh, Jeff uh, discovered that it obviously has a uh, negative influence on the water temperature. So a lower temperature is more favourable for the chytrid fungus. Um, and that obviously influences the ability of uh, grayling grass frogs to persist. But salinity also has an influence. And so again, um, paradoxically, it, more saline uh, sites, uh, they tend to, to a certain extent, be, be uh, better or allow ground and grass roots to persist um, in the presence of the chitri fungus because the salt is fungus oil. Um, so we swabbed and as many frogs as we could catch, which relatively wasn't that many. Uh, so ideally, give or take, the number that you'd like to swab to assess the presence of kitchen fungus at a site like this is 30. But uh, we worked with what we could. Um, they came back all negative for the fungus. But the time of year, there are a couple of other things that cause issues for us. So the time of year, because kitchen does better at cooler temperatures, and we were doing this at the height of summer, uh, there's less, there tends to be less chytrid uh, in, in the landscape. Uh, so ov uh, obviously uh, less easily detected. Uh, doesn't mean that it's, you know, may not be as prevalent in winter. Uh, 
about the cooler times of year. Uh, salinity, interestingly, oh well, and apart from that, uh, we swabbed whatever frogs we could catch, uh, which can also be an issue because, uh, if you like, they all have different favourability uh, for in infection by the fungus. They're not all uh, infected in the same way or with the same chytrid load, uh, which, which uh, you know, can obviously cause issues. If we had our way, we uh, focus on one species. Uh, lower salinity than we might expect from a site, or a lot of sites where uh, growing grass frogs are found now, at least since uh, chytrid became an issue. Uh, but there could be other factors influencing uh, how chytrid is doing at this site, like the temperature, um, you know, among perhaps some other things, which I won't necessarily go into now. To finish up quickly, um, so areas for further investigation. So to find out why the frogs are persisting at this particular site, where elsewhere in the middle and the upper Yarra catchment, as far as we know, they no longer occur. Um, but it goes to show that occasionally you're surprised. Um, you know, even growling grass frogs can be a bit cryptic in their behaviour. Um, but it leads on to another really important point. The, they went that long uh, without uh, being found or known to occur in the area, uh, so since 2006. Uh, but it's not to say that they're not there. Most of the water bodies around Coldstream and Gruyere are private and they're not easily accessible at least to the public. Um, and so as a priority, uh, working with Melbourne Water and Shire of Yarra Rangers and amenable landowners to see whether uh, we can get access uh, to survey uh, dams and other water bodies on private properties adjoining and, uh, and surrounding uh, the, the area where the frogs are found. Um, and then beyond that, looking at what can be done to necessarily enhance the habitat on the property itself uh, but anywhere else where the frogs might turn up and in future improving connectivity for the frogs um, at the landscape scale um, and maybe beyond that uh, so I had talked with Claire Keeley who did her PhD on the conservation genetics of growling grass frog a few years ago um, and maybe not as a, so much of a priority uh, for um, influencing what might be able to be done practically for the frogs in terms of their conservation, uh, but uh, looking at the genetics might still at least be of conservation interest, uh, or at least emphasise the importance of that population, uh, but also uh, confirming the origin of the frogs, possibly. So we assume that they are a, a remnant or relic uh, po population that's held on, uh, or could it be possible that they've uh, arrived more recently from someone else? And with that, I'll finish up there.